You ever see a game over and over and over and you think it looks so weird, but also like kinda interesting? Obviously you're somewhat interested in it, but never enough to actually go out of your way to play it. But it's something that you keep telling yourself you do want to try sometime. For me, that game is Space Station Silicon Valley. I remember seeing it in Nintendo Power back in high school, uh, back when I would uh, look through older issues from the 90s, and you would see all of these weird 3D renders of these dorky looking animals. Oh my god, look at that bear, Jesus. But the first time I ever would have seen this game was back in daycare. I used to go there for the summer back in like uh, second or third grade, and I used to watch the big kids play N64 games. And I remember one of them was this game, and it was such a weird game to me at the time. All I remember was like, they were playing as a fox, and there was a dude with his legs sticking out of a toilet. We were all little kids at the time, so of course we thought that was like the funniest thing ever, but that is like the only thing I could remember from that game. I didn't remember a single other detail. Years after that, I would try to find it again by googling like every combination of uh, N64 game, Fox, guy in toilet. And I would never be able to find it because every time Google was like, what are you talking about? Uh, but then a couple of years after that, I would go through old issues of Nintendo Power again, and there it was. That was the game, Space Station Silicon Valley. That's the, that's the daycare toilet man game found it. It seemed to be warmly received when it came out back in 98, Nintendo Power calling it the sleeper hit of the year. IGN even gave it an award for most innovative game, but while it managed to stick out from all of the other releases at the time as something unique and interesting, it was never really picked up as a popular title, doing pretty badly in the sales department. I guess the prominent weirdness that it flaunted didn't really grab people that much, a classic case of judging a book by its cover. Those weird renders they marketed the game with probably had people thinking it to just be something strange rather than something interesting. I mean, like I said, it was that one weird game that I always wanted to try someday. Not enough to put it on my priority list. If I were seeing it back then being advertised, I probably wouldn't have bought it new. But today is the day that I finally checked this game out. I've been wanting to see what this thing was all about for so long. Like, I wonder if it was really that good. Like, how does it hold up now? What kind of weirdness can we expect from a game that I literally only remember because there is a guy in a toilet? Oh, I've been wanting to do this for so long, so let's do it. DMA Design made this. Can't really say I'm familiar with those guys. Uh, apparently, they're the company that later became Rockstar North? I'll have two number nines. Yeah, like, like that, Rockstar North. Wild. But long before that, they were the guys that made all of those Lemmings games that were published by Psygnosis. But between then and now, they made a couple of N64 games, one of which being Body Harvest. That's another one I've been wanting to try for a while. During this period, they were known as DMA Design. Damn, I guess I was more familiar with them than I thought. Gotta love that intro screen, you know, with the characters interacting with the logo. That is classic. Um, hello? Is anything gonna... I, I, I think the game crashed i think nothing's happening weird let's reset same thing happens again why is this happening let's can we skip it there we go oh wow this title screen runs at 60 fps that is so weird you you really don't see 60 fps much in n64 games that are 3d the actual game runs at 30 but all of the menus and stuff run 60 that's really cool but part of me was kind of annoyed because that meant i had to record the the game at 60 fps instead of 30 which means my video file sizes are gonna be like twice as big Oh well, I mean I literally just upgraded to an 8 terabyte, so it's not a big deal. The setup here is pretty funny. We tune into channel 1 News to hear about the titular space station returning to orbit after being lost in space for 1,000 years. All of the robotic animals that were on board have taken over and probably killed all the scientists that were on board. So the president of the world, Mrs. Frank Bloke? I feel like there's a British joke here I'm not getting. Uh, they hire Dan, Danger, and Evo. What, did she get them off a damn infomercial? I, I guess so. Uh, they're sent to the space station to save the world. Save the world? Wait, like, from what? Is it gonna is it gonna crash into Earth or something? There's a little more story in the game's manual, but I unfortunately don't have that. But that's what scans are for. Bless you, video game preservationists. You guys are the real heroes. Not these dorks. Okay, uh, in 2001, the space station was created, but they lost it after seven minutes? 
These guys really just love throwing, like, whatever stupid numbers in there, huh? Alright, so I guess the space station has been lost for 1,000 years after it vanished in 7 minutes. It really doesn't take long for this game's sense of humor to start bleeding through. Oh, apparently they're sending Dan Danger and Evo because they're cheap and they don't want to lose any more good space marines. And yeah, it mentions this thing is on a collision course with Earth, so that's why we gotta stop it. On their way to the space station, the two get into an argument over the music they're listening to, and Evo punches Dan in the face! Why? He's piloting the ship! What are you doing? And they crash land, of course. And they crash land. I, I said, and they crash. Uh, hello, is something going to happen? What's going on here? Did the did the game crash again? I must have restarted the game like three times at this point, but every single time this cutscene locks up at this exact point. And you can't skip the cutscene either, so I can't get past this. What's going on? Oh, you know what? I remember. I know what's happening. There's our culprit, the N64 Memory Expansion Pack. I totally forgot about this. There's a glitch in this game that makes it incompatible with this thing. If you want to play it and get past that cutscene, you're going to have to exchange this for the original Jumper Pack. Otherwise, for some reason, I don't know why, but Evo's character model cannot spawn. Oh, that's why the title screen locked up too, because it has Evo spawn in. That's really interesting, actually. Anyway, the ship crashes and Evo gets ejected, which scatters his robotic parts everywhere because he smashes into the ceiling and it just leaves this little buggy dude ship behind, which is what Evo is. Uh, so Dan and Evo now have to find Evo's body parts so they can rebuild him and then put a stop to Silicon Valley. Now, with the ship being all that's left of Evo, he can now latch himself onto other robots to take control. This means piloting those various robotic animals that Silicon Valley is populated with. And that is the core concept behind this game. It's a puzzle action platformer that has you swapping between various animals to meet a variety of objectives. This could range from defeating certain animals to activating something like a switch, or simply taking control of a certain animal and then reaching the goal. Each level is a small, open area that you'll freely explore looking for a way to do these objectives, but you often can't explore the full thing as the animal you start with, so you gotta find other animals that can reach different areas. You can take control of a new animal after you attack it enough, it'll deactivate so Evo can toss his little buggy self onto his new host. The first animal you take control of is a dog. He's got a pretty standard jump at a simple bite attack, but that's not enough to get you very far. There's these platforms here that a standard jump can't reach, so let's grab this sheep. It doesn't have an attack, pressing B just makes it go but it can float in the air for a little bit, so now we can hover over to these platforms. Another objective here involves winning a race, so of course we're going to need something fast. This little racer mouse should do the trick, it's got a tail attack, but also a speed boost. The idea here is that each animal has two core moves, one map to the A button and then one map to B. Every time you take control of a new animal for the first time, you get this cool little diagnosis screen showing what it can do, uh, starting of course with the abilities mapped to each button and then a bunch of fluff info that you don't really need to read, but is still there for flavor text. So I guess it's kind of like a better version of Donkey Kong 64. You know, like a, like a platformer where different characters have different moves that you use to meet different objectives. But where Silicon Valley beats DK64 is in its structure. Having the animals littered around the map for you to find and switch to on the fly gives the game much better pacing than running back and forth between a character select barrel over and over. This is the second game I've talked about recently that did exchangeable characters much better than DK64, and that's really really cool because it shows it's an idea that can work and that there are solutions to this problem that are much better and interesting than just mapping characters to a d-pad. I really love how it's pulled off here. There's a level of satisfaction that comes with finding a new animal for the first time and then seeing what it can do and then realizing, oh, I can use this to do something that I noticed earlier. There's a sense of discovery here that's like deeply engaging. This level here is a good example. I'm thinking to myself, how am I going to get these penguins up? here to hit these switches. Like, I can only control one at once, and the rest don't follow me up this elevator. But then I found this bird that can pick up and drop deactivated animals, and using that, I was able to bring up all the penguins. Or this jungle level, where you take control of this gorilla, and then you realize, 
Oh, I can swing on those vines I was seeing earlier. That's how I get up there. There's a lot of different animals too, and they offer a lot of variety in that by having four different worlds, each one being a unique ecosystem home to different types of animals. The first one's a grassy world where you'll find mostly farm animals and stuff like dogs, mice, and foxes. Uh, there's an ice world where you got penguins and polar bears and walruses. We've got a jungle world with turtles, elephants, hyenas, monkeys, and then there's a desert world that's got camels, kangaroos, desert foxes? I, I thought these guys were supposed to be moles at first, but apparently they're supposed to be foxes, which is weird because there's already foxes and they don't even look a lot. They're robots, who cares? Some of the animals come with some pretty ridiculous abilities too. I mean, you start off with dogs that bite, rams that ram, mice that tail whip, but later on, you start playing as animals fully equipped with homing missiles and grenade launchers. I like these guys. They've got a good jump and a freaking gun. It's got some good spread to it too. And that brings me to something I'm really iffy on in this game. I feel like sometimes it does it well, but other times it, it just does not. So of course I'm talking about combat, which is something I've noticed platformers, especially B-grade platformers, tend to not do very well. But I mean like this is a game where you have to knock out an enemy before you take control of it, so it's bound to happen. You need that, and I don't mind that because biting at a sheep or blowing something up before taking control of it is a lot of fun. I do like that, but it's because it's less about the intricacies of actually fighting and more so about applying the correct animal to the situation. But keep in mind, this character decked out with these deadly weapons, that's something you have to fight before you can play as it, and sometimes it can be frustratingly difficult to do that without just getting destroyed by it. This level here is a good example of one that really frustrated me. Uh, you play as this hyena and you have to lure this hippo to an underwater switch because the hippo sinks and the hyena doesn't. But the hyena doesn't stand a chance against the hippo because it kills you in like two or three hits, so you have to lure it. But even doing that is really hard because it has a projectile attack that kills you in like two hits, so it's so freaking hard to get anywhere with it. And if you're using melee attacks against a similar animal that you're playing as, it may as well be a game of rock, paper, scissors. You're both doing damage to each other at a pretty much equal rate, so whoever comes out victorious is practically random. And anything with explosives can destroy you in a matter of seconds if you're not careful, and since this game does not have lives, you have to start the entire level over if you make one little misstep. And these levels can be pretty long too, that's like 20 minutes of stuff you gotta do all over sometimes. You really could have given me like, I don't know, two or three lives so there was a little bit more room for error? Come on. Now sometimes I do think this is handled well, like yeah, you get annihilated, but on your second run, you realize that facing it head on might not be a good idea in this level, so you explore other options, especially when factoring in that animals react to each other, whether you're in control of them or not. Great example right here, I gotta get this penguin past this missile equipped husky dog that's on turbo skis. No, no, there's no way, you just die every time, instantly, he just destroys you. But then I notice there's a polar bear with a cannon down below, so I lure the husky down the slope. It's on skis, so it can't stop, and it ends up down by the polar bear, where it gets blasted to pieces. Of course, sometimes you're gonna have to work your way up the food chain, you know, get an animal that can take out a larger one, and so on, but other times, that seems like the obvious answer, when it's really not. You gotta think more with your brain rather than brawn. Like this level here, it's got this missile-ready dog circling the barn, ready to blow anything it sees to smithereens. I start as a mouse that can't really do anything to that dog, obviously, so I initially think to tank out this ram so I can beat the dog with it. But that proved to be a terrible idea because this ram destroys me. The mouse is no match for it. It ain't happening. But then I thought to change back into the mouse after I used the sheep to open the bridge because it didn't occur to me at first, but this missile dog, it wants to kill sheep, not mice. Minded no attention to little mousey me over here. So as the mouse, I was able to use this uh, machine thing to knock out the dog. Then I could control it and blow whatever I wanted the frick up. It's moments like this where the game really shines. It's not about whether or not you have the skill to outlast your enemies, but rather outsmart them. But then there's other times where the game does make you rely on brawn. You will just have to duke it out with no other option sometimes, and this is where I found myself kind of frustrated. Like this army of scorpions here, it's so easy to get messed up by them, even when you're in control of the animal that you're supposed to use to defeat them. And no, it's not a matter of, uh, we'll just get better at the game and uh, get good. No, like, these controls are not fit for this kind of combat. With the slow movement speed, it's nearly impossible to dodge attacks, and without an intuitive way of aiming, it's way too hard to land hits without getting messed the frick up in some scenarios. 
I think if the game was brave enough to sacrifice some of that action so it could lean entirely in the direction of outsmarting the other animals, I think the game would have aged a lot better for it. I was having a lot of fun when I was using the animals' abilities to navigate the stage and solve puzzles, but whenever the game's like, oh, uh, fight this thing, also you're probably gonna die a bunch, I enjoyed the game a lot less. Some of the animal abilities I also found kind of frustrating, like the fox's dash move. It barely ever works for me. You come to a hard stop at a ledge, but I need to get onto that table, so you have to deal with this really picky timing as you drop. Took me way too many tries for something that should have been pretty simple. And the vine swinging too. I was all for the idea, but the controls for this are just so sluggish and easy to screw up the momentum with. I must have been at this one set of vines for like 10 freaking minutes trying over and over just to make it work. That's kind of a constant problem with this game, the speed. A lot of animals move way too slow. I mean, you will get the occasional guy decked out with some wheels and you can get around quickly with your speed boost, but a lot of levels have you crawling at a snail's pace. I I definitely would not recommend this game to anybody who's impatient when it comes to getting where you need to go. Also, the camera, it really does not like cooperating sometimes. I know that's typical of games from this era, you know, when 3D was new and developers are like, how do you do a camera? But it still really got on my nerves every now and then. Like, I, I just want to see where I'm going and the game does not want to show me where I'm going. Those are pretty much all of my complaints about this game. Some of it is just unfortunately the product of the hardware and the era and I do think think some of that is forgivable to an extent, but I do think a lot of these things could have been avoided because they stem from the core design and not the actual gameplay. That said though, these things did frustrate me sometimes, but they did not stop me from loving this game, because otherwise, this is a hard game not to love. As people said back when it came out, it really truly is unique from anything else on the platform, not just in how it plays, but the humor and the look of it and the sound. This game's got some serious groove, let me tell you that right now, like the music, it really stuck out to me. It's like this upbeat elevator jazz, it's so catchy. And the way the animals often bob their heads and tap their feet to it, it is just, it is just fantastic. I've also noticed that the music in this game is entirely diegetic. Like, it's actually there in the world of the game being played off of these speakers. You can, you can even hear the music change in volume as you approach one. The idea of the space station having this music actually playing, since it's like a zoo or a tourist attraction or something, it makes a lot of sense, and I really like that. The humor in this game is pretty great too. It's that cynical kind of humor that you'd expect from games like Banjo-Kazooie. Dan hates everything, and he's gonna take every chance he gets to let you know that. I love how the missions are like, not formally written at all. It's like a pissed off grumpy idiot telling you what he thinks you have to do. Get me a thing on a spring. Oh, he he means, he means find a spring sheep. Turn on the big computer th thing. Well, at least I know what it is he wants. Like, if he called it what it was actually called, I probably wouldn't know what I'm looking for. The game's casual language actually makes it pretty easy to understand your goals, because it's never going to be something like, uh, deactivate the quantum collider. No, it'll be like, turn off the big machine. And I mean, like, yeah, that's a good description. I, I, I know what a big machine is. Oh, that also brings me back to the diagnosis screen. They label the abilities as skill A and skill B, which makes it really easy to understand which buttons do what actions. And the mission synopsis is never a real debriefing. It's just Dan saying some stupid nonsense. Flapping honk, Evo. What does that mean? Is that like gibberish they use? Because they, they couldn't put swear words in a... You read a game where they're trying to say fucking hell, Evo? <laughs> Is that what they were going for? Oh, that reminds me. I, I found it really weird how they constantly use the word kill. Like, they say, kill the animals. Like, firstly, it's just kind of strange to see the word kill in a kid-friendly game from this era. Usually they would say something like a defeat or take out or whatever. Not to mention they're not even real animals. So you're technically not killing them because they're robots. Uh, you'd think it would say something like function ceased or something. I don't know. Function! Ceased. Every world ends with a mini game that you gotta play to get one of Evo's body parts back. Uh, the first one is this airplane dog fighting game. N no, I mean like literally dog fighting. Get it? That's that. That's cute. I'll give him that. 
Um, I really wasn't that into this. I mean, it's just a matter of personal preference. I don't think it's that bad a minigame. I just don't really like games where you're like, a fly a plane or a spaceship or something. Games like Star Fox, it was just never really my cup of tea. Um, but I did keep dying over and over and over and I was getting kind of like pissed off until I realized you're supposed to fly down here to recover your health. So make sure you know to do that unless you want to get your butt kicked like I did. Second one is a walrus race. This one's kind of fun. It's not much I can really say about it. It's just a race, but yeah, I like this one. The third one can burn in hell though. It's a freaking rail shooter. Seriously? The last thing I want to play in any game, let alone a platformer, is a damn turret segment. You gotta score, I think, I think over 1300. At least that's what I got when I finally beat it. Every other time it was like, nope, you didn't kill enough animals and I had to start the whole thing over. And it's like, it's a time-based thing, right? You don't go at your own pace, you just have to wait for it and it's so time-consuming. Imagine doing that like, like, seven times before you get it. And it's really hard to gauge distance and land your shots too because your arrows have dropped to them and with the short draw distance because it's on N64 it's so hard to see whether or not you're even hitting the animals most of the time this thing straight up roadblocked me for like an hour before I could get past it delete this from the game please get rid of it I hate it it sucks the last one's a boxing match where you plays this kangaroo and you literally just punch the other uh, uh, character until you win it's not terribly difficult as long as you memorize the patterns and back off when they attack but but you do get to hear this really bad version of Eye of the Tiger. I don't really think the mini games add much to this game. I mean, I understand wanting variety, but I feel like having tons of different animals to control already gave the game the healthy variety that it needed. Switching genres entirely for a level, it's not really something I often care for. You can have variety and keep the game the genre it is. If I put a platformer in my N64, it's because I wanted to play a platformer, not because I want to play a shooting gallery. Like seriously, too many games did this back then. Anyway, uh, once you have all Vivo's body parts together, you can rebuild him, and it's now time to tackle the final stage. A Silicon Valley crashes to Earth, and all the animals run rampant on New York City. Well, I'm assuming it's New York City because the Statue of Liberty is there. Hey, I've been there. I know what I'm looking at. You've got a limited time to destroy all 50 animals, but now that Evo's back to his old robotic self, you get to do it with your turbo laser that annihilates everything. It's a really satisfying conclusion because, you know, you spend the game as a defenseless little bug latching onto whatever animals you can to survive, but here, it's a total power trip. You rip and tear through everything, and then you watch the credits. There are also some bonus trophies you can collect for 100% completion. Every level has a hidden objective that you can meet to spawn it in. It usually involves interacting with something you notice in the environment, like a series of switches that are unrelated to your main mission and require going out of your way to organize the animals you need to hit them. Other times, it's a matter of uh, do all of this thing, like uh, eat all of the cheese that the, that the mice eat or whatever, or kill all of the scorpions in this level. Sometimes it's a lot of work and it's not really worth it. In fact, it really isn't worth it because it's actually impossible to get all these trophies to begin with. Why, you're probably wondering. Well, it's because somebody forgot to program collision in this trophy, so you can't pick it up. You just walk right through it. This game is absolutely infamous for this. If there is one piece of trivia you know about this game, this is probably it. It's not even that far into the game. It's only in like the fifth level, so how this got past playtesting is beyond me, but oh well, mistakes happen. They weren't the high budget GTA devs that we know now. They didn't have as many resources to achieve that level of polish back then. And I'm sure this sort of thing probably would have been fixed in a second printing because, you know, back before updates were a thing and companies could patch their games after release, what they used to do is if there was a known error when they were doing a second print, they would just fix the game so like the later copies would have those fixes. Um, Ocarina of Time is probably one of the more well-known examples in N64. Not to say that there was like problems with it, but there are a bunch of notable differences between the early cartridges and the later cartridges. But on Unfortunately, Space Station didn't really sell too well, so I can't imagine a second print would have ever been issued. And it's so crazy because there is something you can unlock for getting all of the trophies. I mean, it's just a lame Asteroids clone that isn't really that fun at all and certainly not worth the effort of getting all those trophies, but the fact that there is something in here to unlock that is completely inaccessible without cheat 
codes now. That is just bonkers to me. And yeah, you can just enter an in-game cheat code to unlock it. You don't need Game Shark or anything. They lucked out and they put that in the game itself. So I guess that all works out in the end. If you really want 100% the game, just get all the trophies except that one. Type in the code. A, you did it fair and square, kinda. So uh, yeah, that's Space Station Silicon Valley definitely hasn't aged too well, and I did find myself pretty frustrated with it sometimes because of that, but otherwise, this is still a really unique game. There's not a whole lot of stuff out there that's really like this, and I really enjoyed playing it for the most part. I'd say, at least conceptually, this is pretty much what I'm looking for in a 3D platformer. It's got unique concepts, good variety, solid puzzles, exploration, and of course, some good old platforming. If you've never played this game before and you fancy yourself a platformer kind of dude, I'd definitely recommend it. You just gotta go in knowing that you will be playing something that's gonna have all the issues that were common with games back then. Weirdly enough, there was a PlayStation port two years later, released only in Europe. I could never get used to PAL PS1 cases, they're so bulky, what's with that? DS cases are the same way over there, I don't get it, you're just wasting more shelf space and plastic. For some weird reason, they renamed this version Evo Space Adventures? That's a much less interesting title if you ask me, but I don't know, maybe they thought the intricate name was part of the reason it didn't market well? Maybe? I don't know. The title screen and menus are totally different. Still at 60 FPS though, uh, the intro's the same, the in-engine parts are replaced with pre-rendered versions that don't look much better, and they run at a really bad frame rate. Load times are really long. Really long. Really long. Okay, here we go. Uh, all right. Graphics are bad. Frame rate's bad. There's like a full second of input lag, too. What is with that? Where's the sound effects? A lot of them are gone. Oh my god. The graphics are so jittery. It's like the world's about to tear apart. You can see the seams in the ground. Oh, this camera is nauseating. Good lord. The way it's vibrating, it's like, it looks like somebody duct taped it to a washing machine and enabled content aware scaling. This is vomit inducing. I actually felt sick after playing this for a little while. Not to mention the game literally plays in slow motion. Like if you thought the characters moved slowly before, get a load of this. And I understand that PAL region games run at a lower frame rate, but even by those standards, the performance here is inexcusably poor. But hey, look on the bright side. They fixed the item glitch. Hey, you can get the item. Hey, it's Sega does. So Sony does with Nintendo. Don't. This has got to be hands down. Hands down the worst port of a game I've ever played in my life. Like, how did this thing get printed? Was there no quality control? Like, I could not imagine playing this version to the end. Like, could you imagine being a kid that had this version, completely unaware that there's a better version of the game out there, and suffering all the way through it? Please, guys, put more work into your ports. Nobody deserves to play a version of a game this bad. It was ported by a company called RuneCraft. I tried googling that, but I just got RuneScape and Minecraft. Go figure. I think I can easily say that I had a really good time with this game, despite its signs of age and the handful of levels that had me quite frustrated. I know there's also a Game Boy Color version, but I don't have it, I've never played it, and I can't really say anything about it, but I can at least say to avoid the PS1 version. It is terrible. If you find yourself interested in this game, please play the N64 version. But uh, yeah, I'd say while the quality of the gameplay definitely isn't what it was back then, the quality of the ideas still makes this game absolutely worth checking out today.